I should like to call your attention this evening to that great incident in the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul, which is recorded in the portion of Scripture read, namely in the 17th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles from verse 16 to the end of the chapter. But I want in particular to emphasize the 21st verse, the 21st verse in the 17th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now this uh, incident is uh, of very great interest and importance judged from many standpoints. It's interesting uh, in the life and story and ministry of this great man, the Apostle Paul. But what makes it particularly interesting is that here we find Paul in the famous city of Athens. It is one of the greatest uh, encounters that has ever taken place. Here is the Apostle, the Christian preacher, and here he is standing up and preaching in the Mecca of uh, all philosophy and the center of art and of culture. It's a very dramatic incident, but I want to try to show you that it is also a very important one for every one of us who is here tonight. Because what we really have here is an explanation of the whole of human history. Now we are living in days of history and of crisis. And nothing is more important, as most people are ready to grant, whether they are Christians or not, as our view of history and of our view of the whole course of the world, of what is happening today and what may well happen in the immediate future. I say that here we have the key to human history, because human history, in the last analysis, can be reduced to this. It's been a great conflict between two powers, two great forces. One has been man's culture, man's wisdom, what you can call, if you like, civilization. And on the other hand, the Word of God and everything that has called men to view themselves and their lives and everything else in the life of God. It would be a very simple thing for me to show you how this conflict has been proceeding. And sometimes one seems to be in the ascendant and sometimes the other. The Old Testament, in a sense, is nothing but a picture of this continuing conflict, the nations of the world and their civilizations and cultures, and this people of God have gone on, and the tension and the fight. Well, now, here it's concentrated for us in a very interesting and in a very remarkable manner, and it enables us, therefore, to see the entire situation in which we have found ourselves. Because the other thing that stands out here on the very surface of this is that our understanding of this conflict between these two views and these two ways of life is not something which is merely of a theoretical or an academic interest. It's something that applies to every one of us something that calls to a decision on the part of every single human being. You notice how this uh, chapter ended. Uh, the apostle was preaching and we read that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again on this matter. That's one group, but there was another. How be it? Certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, 
and a woman named Damaris and others with them. You see, there was a division. Some believed what Paul was saying. Others mocked and rejected the message. And what I'm going to try to show you is this, that we are all confronted by this choice. Every one of us, indeed, in this congregation at this moment is in one or the other of these two positions. We are either holding on to the world and its civilization and culture, or else we belong to the people of God. And it's a tremendously important decision because we are being carried along every moment we live towards the ultimate final, irrevocable decision. So that I want to try to show you that there is nothing that is more important for every one of us at this moment than to know for certain on which of these two sides we are. I'm going to try to do in my feeble way what the great apostle did in Athens. He reasoned with them. And my friends, Christianity is something that calls people to reason. I say that because there seem to be some today who think that Christianity is here to call people to sing. Well, you can sing if you like, but in times like these, surely we must think and reason and face the facts. This idea that Christianity is some kind of sub-stuff or the opium of the people that is just a matter of pulling down the blinds and singing hymns and choruses and getting emotional. It's a travesty of Christianity. Look at this men here reasoning, arguing with the Stoics and the Epicureans and with many others in this famous city of Athens. And I say that as we value our life in the present moment and as we look to the uncertain future and above all to our deaths which are bound to come, here is the most vital question of all. Which is it? Are we trusting to civilization or are we trusting to the living God? Well, now then, let's have a look at these two things. Here they are. They're set out before us. Here is a picture of the long history of the human race. Let's start by looking at civilization, human culture. This, of course, is the thing to which most people today cleave. That is why everybody knows that uh, our chapels and churches are becoming emptier. Only 10% of the people in this country even claim to be religious. What about the others? What are they trusting to? Well, they're trusting to civilization. They're trusting to human knowledge and to human ideas. They're, this decision is being made. Everybody is involved in it. So let's have a look at civilization so-called. Now, one of the things that I must mention, and it's because it comes in here, one of the things that it's very important for us to remember, as we take a glance at the whole course of history, is that we notice that civilization uh, varies in its ascendancy. I've said that there have been periods when civilization seemed to be in control and uh, Christianity and religion seem to be dying and uh, moribund and practically finished. But civilization has had its kind of periodicity. Uh, there have been great periods when the world seemed to be advancing towards perfection. Then suddenly there's a change. Now that's important for this reason that by when the Apostle Paul arrived in Athens, the real glory of Greece had already passed. It was already in decline. And another great uh, manifestation of civilization was rising, and that was the great Roman Empire. But you see, that also declined. And then you went through the dark Middle Ages, but then there was what was called the Renaissance, the revival of learning. Actually, they went back to this Greek teaching. And that came in. And it's, in a sense, been controlling ever since, particularly since the 18th century, when we had the so-called Enlightenment. 
And it was then that men began to deride and to criticize the Bible and its message and to turn their backs upon it and to turn to civilization. Well, now, the point I'm establishing is this, that you and I are living in a period when the vaunted civilization of the world is again in a state of crisis. It's in a state of decline. In other words, you and I tonight here are very much in the same position as obtained in Athens at the time when the apostle visited it. Now, I don't want you to take my word for that. Let me quote you no less an authority than Dr. Henry Kissinger, until lately the Secretary of State of the United States of America. Dr. Kissinger is not a Christian. He says so. But he's a man who probably knows more about the state of the world than most people. And this is what he has said recently. We are at the watershed. We are at a period which in retrospect is either going to be seen as a period of extraordinary creativity or a period when really the international order came apart politically, economically, and morally. Dr. Henry Kissinger, that's his observation. And there are many others who are in entire agreement with him. We are clearly at a point when a civilization that has been in control for a long time is shaking before our eyes and is coming to an end. We're on a watershed, says Dr. Henry Kissinger. So that never was it more urgent for us uh, to make quite sure uh, that we understand exactly what it is that civilization has to offer us and then what it is that the biblical Christian message has to offer us on the other side. Well, now let's have a look at civilization and what do we find? Well, here I want to put its main characteristics before you. It is something that always starts with man. Man is the center. Now, these Greeks uh, whom Paul was confronting here, they're great teachers. They had taught that. They said man is the measure of everything. You see, man is supreme. There's nothing beyond man. Man, and they trusted his reason, his intellect, his brain power, his understanding, his capacity for search, seeking after truth, experimentation, and the arrival at ultimate knowledge. Now, this was its great characteristic, and they were full of confidence in this ability of man to make a perfect world so that we could all live harmoniously in it and enjoy our lives. Now, this is the basis of civilization. And as you know, uh, most people who are not interested in religion tonight uh, are in this position. They say they believe in man. Now, there's a good deal to be said at first sight in favor of their view. Look at the achievements of civilization. Take this great Greek civilization, uh, which had obtained in Athens and in Greece before Paul went there. The achievement was really quite astonishing. What were they interested in? Well, they were primarily interested in life itself. Their great men was, were the so-called philosophers. What's a philosopher? Well, a, man, a philosopher is a man who, finding himself in this world and finding problems and difficulties and unhappinesses, begins to ponder and to think and to ask questions and to say, well, now, why is this? Were things meant to be like this? What is man? What is life? What's the object and the purpose of it all? And so they began to evolve their theories. And it worked out in many directions. They were very interested in politics. They introduced the very term. It applied to the sort of government of their city-states. And they were very interested in this. They said, well, now, we, surely we can bring some order into the chaos. So they began to work out systems of government 
It is there you invented the term democracy, of which we hear so much at the present time. They were the people who began to teach about democracy. And they said, you know, it's no use people living anyhow, somehow. We've got to uh, analyze the whole of life and we've got to divide up men and women according to their respective gifts and abilities into various grades and we've got to appoint them various tasks and they are done so with great thoroughness. Politics. Well, then, of course, they uh, proceeded to try to put this into practice. But not only that. They said man is a creature of marvelous power. And these are to be used and to be exercised. So they had great poets. They had great dramatists. Probably with the excep exception of Shakespeare, the greatest dramatist that the world has ever known. And there again, you see, they were concerned about understanding the great mystery and the problem of life. And they put forward their view of life. But beyond that, they were very interested in architecture. They put up magnificent buildings, wanted to express the sense of beauty and of wonder. The same applied to sculpture. It's worth visiting the ruins of these buildings and these bits of sculpture, even at the present time. And they went into all this with great thoroughness. Not only that, they were very interested in speech. The greatest orators that the world has ever known were Greeks. Look at that man Demosthenes. Still stands out as one of the greatest orators of all time. Another man called Pericles, who delivered his great orations when the city of Athens was being attacked. These things have come down the centuries because of their grandeur and because of their sheer magnificence. These were mighty achievements. And they had a kind of rudimentary science. There are many in this congregation who have had to struggle with geometry. And you've come across the name of Pythagoras, Euclid. These are the men who founded it all. Everything that we are taught is based upon the original thinking of these mighty men. And on top of all this, they were very interested in sport and in the culture and the cultivation of the body. Well, now, there is a very brief summary for you of what... Culture, civilization stood for and represented. And there is no question at all that it, it is one of the most remarkable and amazing achievements that the world has ever known. There it is. And Paul was in the very center, the mecca of it all, the great city of Athens. Here comes this little man, this little Jew, nothing to look at at all dismissed as a babble, here he stands in the midst of this mighty achievement and he's opposing it. Very well. Now that's what the civilization was. But what I'm anxious to show you is this. That that isn't the end of the story of civilization. It was a magnificent achievement. But it was already failing to satisfy how do I know that? Well, you notice one defect at once. When the Apostle Paul appeared, you notice what they said about him. They dismissed him as a babbler. What will this babbler say? And I'll ask that it tends to be a characteristic of those who believe in culture and civilization. They were supercilious. They were conceited. They were the elitists, as they're called now. And they looked down upon the ordinary men, the common men. Of course, to dismiss the Apostle Paul as a babbler was just a confession of their failure to understand. They had no insight at all. But he wasn't well-dressed, and he didn't pose as one of the great teachers, so he was dismissed as a babbler. And you know, civilization has very little use for the ordinary men. They look down upon us from a great height. These great people who write their clever articles to the Sunday newspapers today, and you can hear the pundits on the television. Have you noticed the conceit, the affected accent? The superiority, the air of superiority on the ordinary man. He's all right for menial tasks, but he doesn't understand. 
Now that's a weakness. And it's one of the weaknesses that shows the ultimate hollowness of civilization. But you know, I've got something still more striking to tell you. And that's why I've chosen this 21st verse. Listen to this again. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that they hadn't got anything. People are always waiting for something new, are confessing that they're not satisfied with what they've got. And that was the trouble in Athens, as I've told you. The great men, the great teachers, had gone some two or three centuries before Paul visited Athens. Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, the mightiest philosophers that the world has ever known, with their incomparable teaching, as I've described it to you, and yet, you see, these people are not satisfied, waiting for some new thing. Anybody who turned up with a new theory or a new idea, they rushed after him. Why? They were not satisfied. There was a dissatisfaction. Here were the Stoics saying one thing, the Epicureans saying the exact opposite, then various other schools. You had these great schools, these porches, these academies. And they were rivals, and they were arguing and debating and confuting one another, and the people were utterly confused. So that anybody who came along with a new idea, they rushed after him. Is this going to be it? Actually, of course, there was nothing new in any of the teachings that came along, the new things, the fashions, the intellectual and other fashions that they were running after. As somebody's put it very well, it wasn't new as such but sufficiently diverse from what had gone before to stimulate a jaded and languid society. That was Athens. Isn't it this country tonight? A jaded and a languid society. And here they were, you see, without realizing it, confessing a bankruptcy. All they had and all they'd been taught and all they'd learned it didn't satisfy. They still needed something more. So they rushed after the new. And of course, we are living in a similar age today. There's certain advantages in getting old, you know. You can look back. And when I look back at the fashions that I've seen in this kind of respect, my friends, it is, if it were not so tragic, it would be very amusing and very laughable. And let me be honest, this is what's been happening in the so-called Christian church. The fashions I've seen coming in, names that everybody was quoting and everybody reading, quite forgotten. They've come one after the other. I remember the time when Karl Barth's name first came, and everybody was reading Karl Barth. He went to a man called Bultmann, came and pushed Karl Barth out, and there have been many others. D.R. Davis, John S. Whale, well, he's still alive, whoever hears of him. Here they are, you see, the fashions. What's it mean? They're not satisfied. With all that they'd had, there was something deep down that was dissatisfied. But let me show you the failure in another respect. Did you notice what we were told at the beginning? While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now remember, we are reading here about Athens, the center of philosophy. Yet when Paul, he got there before his companions, and while he was waiting for them to come along, he walked around the city. And what struck him was that the place was cluttered up with temples to the various gods. And he found that strange temple with that peculiar inscription to the unknown god. But the point of interest is this, that Athens of all places was full of temples. Now why was this? Well, Paul says, uh, I see he says that you are too, I perceive that in all things, you are too superstitious. You can translate that if you like, you are too religious. You are too idolatrous. But what's the meaning of this? Well, can't you see the meaning is quite obvious. These people had come to the realization that philosophy and human reason were not enough. There seemed to be something else. 
again to quote an authority, where human learning most flourished, idolatry most abounded. This is a most amazing thing. Now I'm calling attention to it all as you see because it is such a perfect description of this country of ours at this present time. We've never had more learning, we've never had more idolatry. But what does it tell us? Well, what it tells us is this, that these people had a profound uncertainty, profound dissatisfaction. I agree with Professor John Kenneth Galbraith. This is the age of uncertainty, and it's uncertainty about the great facts of life, death, and eternity. What was the matter with these people? Well, it was this. They had listened to the great teaching of the great philosophers, and it took them so far, and then they felt, oh, there must be something else. There must be some, there are some unseen influences. They said there's a God of war, a God of love, a God of peace. There's a God in the moon, another in the stars. And they believed that these were influencing the world and that they had a greater power than the, the understanding of men. So they said there's only one thing to do as we're in the hands of these unseen gods and unseen spiritual powers. We'd better build temples to them and we'll go there and present offerings to them. And they made temples with their own hands as the apostle reminds them. They made their own gods, their own idols, built temples for them, and then was bowed down and worshipped them. The, these learned people, these philosophers, and the people who had been listening to the philosophers, I say it's just a confession of complete failure. And then this strange temple with this peculiar inscription to the unknown God. What did it mean? Well, it meant this. They said, well, now we know the God of war, the God of peace, and the God of love. We know these various gods. And then they felt there's a God behind them all. There seems to be some mighty God at the back. They sought after him. They tried to find him, and they couldn't. And the most they could get to was the unknown God. They feared this God, but they didn't know him. They, as Paul reminded the Corinthians later, uh, the world by wisdom knew not God. They tried to find him. Uh, the philosophers have ever been trying to find God and they can't. And they're as far away tonight as they were in the first century. So they put up the inscription to the unknown God. The failure of civilization. And my dear friends, look at our world tonight. We've multiplied our schools, primary, secondary, universities, further education. I'm not here to denounce these things. I'm simply here to say that there's no greater folly in the world than to put your faith and trust in them and to believe that they can solve all problems, that man with his learning and understanding is supreme. He's not. They fail. Look at your modern world with all our culture and all the lectures and all the books that are coming out of the presses day by day and week by week, and all we've got. But what's the state of the world? There's a greater interest perhaps in astrology today than there has been for a very long time. Cultured, educated people turn up in the daily newspaper, the horoscope. What's going to happen to me today? A belief in astrology. A belief in spiritism, or oh, their endless transcendental meditation. These are the things that are popular, the cults that are springing up round and about us. Look at the men like the late Mr. Aldous Huxley, the novelist, the man who started off as a youth in the 20s, scientific humanism, brain, reason, understanding, and he believed it. But you know, he ended his life as a Buddhist. And in one of his last books, he said, the only hope for the world is mysticism. Like these Athenians, the failure of philosophy and human thinking, and they have to fall back on something transcendental, something beyond us, and they, they don't know what it is. And look at the drink, the alcohol that's being consumed. Never has it been greater. Rational men, philosophical men. He has to take drink to keep going. He has to take drugs. He has to take his sleeping tablets and then his stimulants in the morning to keep going. Never has this been more true of life. The whole world has become idolatrous again. 
And there is a revolt, of course, as a result of all this against reason itself. And some of the most intellectual people in the world have become irrational. They're going back to the land, living in communes, renouncing the world and all its learning, and trying to go back to nature. The same failure as you had in the first century. And yet you see people scoff at religion and turn to man and civilization and knowledge and culture. It had all been tried with a great thoroughness before the Son of God ever came into this world. But on top of all that, there was a terrible moral failure. And the statistics of the time, they're not in the Bible, but the statistics of the time, you can find them in secular books, indicate that the suicide rate amongst the philosophers was higher in proportion than that in any other section of the community. And it wasn't surprising. These men with the greatest brains, they had come up against a brick wall and they couldn't go further. So they just went out in despair, in cynicism and in a final hopelessness. And the life that was being lived by the common people is so terrible that there are some people who even think that the second half of the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans should be expurgated from the Bible, but I'm going to read it to you. You've got to face facts, my friend. It's no use saying man, civilization, culture, religion, nonsense, the preacher, a babbler. This is what it leads to. This is how people were living. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, full of envy, and so on, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, breaking your contract, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. It was a sink of iniquity. That was true of their great cities in Greece, as it became true in Rome. What was the result of all this? It was a collapse. I've described to you the great achievements, and yet you and I read books today, the glory that was Greece. It's no longer there. They've only got the ruins, and it's become a little and comparatively unimportant nation. Once dominated the world, the glory that was Greece, and the great Roman Empire that followed. What about it? Well, there was a man of the name of Gibbon who was born 200 years last year, born in 1776. He wrote a famous book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. That's what happened. So the great and the boasted and the vaunted civilization to which mankind is always ready to trust, it vanishes, it disappears. Very well, there we've taken a hurried glance at the position of civilization. Now, my friends, let me hold the other side before you as briefly as I can. What a contrast. There's great Athens. And here comes this little man, the Apostle Paul. This man they tend to dismiss as a babbler, as I've reminded you. The contrast between them and Paul was not one of ability and understanding and learning, Paul was one of the greatest brains the world has ever known, a mighty intellect. You will simply read his epistles to see what I mean. What's the contrast then? Well, the contrast is this, you see, it's not a matter of ability. They had ability, he has ability. What makes a man religious is not ability. Paul is as able as any of the philosophers. They reject his truth, he believes it. Nothing to do with ability, nothing to do with general knowledge. But it's something else. What does it lead to? Well, what it leads to is this. What strikes you as about Paul? Listen. Then stood Paul in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Then he goes on. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. 
God. Now then, what's the difference? Well, the first thing one notices is this. The certainty, the assurance. They spent their time in either to hear or to tell some new thing. Always waiting for a new theory. Always ready to believe any whisper that somebody's got a theory that's going to explain everything. Dissatisfied. Seeking, looking, hoping. The Apostle Paul stands. He's there because he's found. Because he knows. He hasn't come to seek and to search after truth. He's not come to make a voyage of adventure. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not a quest for truth. The Christian is a man who has found it. He has it. He's certain. He knows. It's the great characteristic of all the preaching of this man. I know whom I have believed. He's not uncertain. He would never have been there but for his certainty. And then he speaks, you notice, with an authority. They had built their temple to the unknown God. They couldn't find him. They were worshipping him in ignorance, in a spirit of fear. When they began to think, they had a feeling that they were after all in his hands. And so they built their temple to the unknown God. St. Paul addresses them saying, Whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. What's this? Well, this is revelation. And this is the whole message of the Bible. Man, trusting to himself, tries to find the truth. And he doesn't succeed, as I've shown you. But the whole glory of the position is this. And that's why I'm here tonight. That's why there's such a thing as a Christian church. God has revealed the truth. Him declare I unto you. Not because he was a better philosopher than the others and had got a step further. No, no. He received the revelation when he was fighting against it. He received it. It was given to him. A commission was given to him when he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. So he declares the truth to them. It isn't reason. It is the message that is given by God himself. What is the message? Let me summarize it for you very hurriedly. And this is the great difference between Christianity and civilization. This does not start with man. It starts with God. Here's his message. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands and so on. In other words, it comes to this. Why is our world as it is tonight? It's because we don't understand it and our minds are too small, too puny. We don't understand the world, we don't understand ourselves. We don't understand why we're behaving as we are. We don't understand, do we, why in this highly sophisticated and educated 20th century we are building bombs that can ruin the whole world and smash it. We don't understand it, do we? And in spite of all the seeking and the searching and all the talking of the clever pundits, the philosophers and others, we are as far away from an explanation as we've ever been. And men are turning, as I say, to scientism and transcendental meditation, any cult that comes along, and finally, drugs. And let's not forget this. Where did the drug-taking habit come from? Well, it was actually started in one of the greatest universities in the world, Harvard University in the United States, and by a professor at Harvard of the name of Timothy Leary. Why did he do it? He did it for this reason. He said, what's the use of thought? We've been living too much, he said, in the realm of reason and cerebration. We must go back to nature. I'm interested in sensations. You'll never arrive anywhere by reason. It's already failed. Well, very well. Take a trip. Take that drug. And you'll rise into some heights where you'll not be thinking with your brain, but you'll be feeling instinctually or instinctively. And you'll have experiences that transcend anything that man can ever express. This is, this is the position. Man doesn't understand, and he's admitting his failure. And he doesn't understand, of course, because he doesn't start with God. 
You don't understand the world. You can't understand history. You can't understand men. You can't understand yourself unless you start with God. This world is not an accident. At the back of it all is this great eternal God who made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. The biblical message that in the beginning God created everything, including man, and made man in his own image and likeness. Here's the world as made by God. Well, what's the matter? Well, what's the matter, said Paul, is this, that though you live and move and have your being in him. You don't know him. You should have sought the Lord, if haply you might feel after him and find him, though he not be far from every one of us. But instead of doing that, you become fools. The original sin was to defy God and to say man is equal to God. That was the original sin, and man fell. And he's been trying to live independently of God ever since. And look at the mess he's made. Read history, my dear friends. This idea that the world is getting better and better is being belied by the facts of life today. We are back at the collapse that happened in Greece and in Rome. There's no question about this. And it's all because, like these people, we are trusting to man and reason instead of submitting ourselves to the revelation of God. The world is as it is because of man's rebellion against God. And it happened way back. That's why the story of man is a repetition of the same thing century after century. But God didn't abandon the world, and Paul brings this out here. He he tells us here quite clearly that God is still in control of the world. He has made of one blood, blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And this is the true explanation of history. There is the history that man makes. There is the history that God makes. And you see it in the Old Testament. You read about these great nations, these great civilizations, but then God acts and he creates his own nation. And this little nation can defeat the great nations. The great nations go down. This keeps on going on. In spite of many imperfections and rebellions, it goes on. God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. And this is the only hope for the world tonight. There is none other. All that men has tried to build is coming to nothing. His understanding is failing him. But the message of the Bible and of Christianity is that God's got a plan. And he's put a limit upon evil. It's God who created governments. It's God who created nations and appointed their bounds. It's God who taught man to order. If he didn't, the whole world would have festered into nothingness. But God has directed men. He was even directing these great Greeks to keep order, to keep sin within limits. That's why you must have government and order. God has ordained this. The powers that be are ordained of God. Man didn't have a bright idea and have magistrates. No, no, it's God who's taught him to do this. God has been guiding, says Paul, in his providence, in his common grace. He's been guiding through the centuries. Now, says Paul, he's winked at certain of the things that have happened. But now there's something new. And so he brings them to this. That man is responsible before God. There have been many judgments in the long history of the human race. Many a man has risen against God, and God has struck him down. Many a great empire, a great dynasty, has risen against God and defied him. He's blown upon them, and they've disappeared. There have been many judgments in the long story of the human race. Look at the great civilization that was once in Egypt, in Assyria, China, these various. But they've gone. This up and down that I described to you at the beginning. And it's all because God is over all. And he does the same with the individual. Yes, says Paul, and listen. There is to be a final judgment. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the whole world in righteousness 
by that men whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Listen, says Paul, in your collapsing civilization, I'm here to tell you that even this isn't the end. Another one may rise and go down. But beyond it all, the whole world is moving in the direction of a final judgment. Now, Dr. Henry Kissinger, he says we're at a watershed. He's thinking in human terms only. He's probably right. It may be the end of all we've known and we may go back to some terrifying, horrible, dark age again. Or he says it may be an age of great creativity. doesn't matter. The point is that whatever it is, the whole of civilization is moving steadily toward that one far-off divine event to which the whole creation moves. And don't you feel there's judgment in the air at the present time? Don't you feel that there's something beyond the mere failure of politicians and these men who are trying to order our affairs? There is. There's to be a great judgment of all the nations and of every individual one of us. We'll all stand before God. A judgment. Listen, says Paul. And remember, he was preaching to philosophers, Stoics and Epicureans. He wasn't preaching in a little mission hall to people regarded as babblers and ignoramuses. He was addressing the mightiest intellects of the ancient world. And he preached the judgment of God to them. And that's what I'm here to preach tonight. I'm not here to tell the government of this country what they should do about President Amin. I'm not here to tell the new president of the United States what he ought to be doing. I don't know. What I do know is this, that this country, United States, presidents and princes and all others are going to stand before God and give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. It is an absolute certainty. It's the revelation of God. But thank God, that is not the end of its message. There's going to be this judgment, says Paul. How does he know it? Well, he says we've got a certainty, we've got an assurance about this, because there's someone who has been raised from the dead. And this is what Paul really preached. This is the positive aspect of his message. They, you see, when they first heard him, they said, what is this man? They said, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For they bring us certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Uh, why, why did they say this? We read earlier that they said, what will this babbler say? Uh, or other some, he seemeth to be the set of forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. That's what his message. What's it mean? Well, it means this, my dear friend. What a privilege it is to be here again to remind you of this old message. It's the only hope for the world at this moment. Jesus of Nazareth. Who's he? He's the Son of God. This is still God's world. God hasn't abandoned it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God has sent his own Son into the world. I'm not a babbler, says Paul, and I'm speaking with authority. Why? Well, because of a fact. This isn't a philosophy. This isn't a theory. This isn't a supposition. There are facts. This is A.D. 1977. Why? Because Jesus of Nazareth has been into the world. And Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. He was a man, yes. But they took him. They condemned him. They crucified him. He died. They buried his body in a grave. They rolled a stone over it and sealed it and put soldiers to guard it. He burst us under the bands of death. God raised him from the dead. Paul would never have been in Athens but for that. This is fact. There'd be no Christian church but for this fact. This is where you see it differs so essentially from civilization and culture and philosophy. Theorizing, seeking, searching. God has acted. The whole Bible is a record of the action of God. Look how he acted in the Old Testament with his own people and against the others. Here you see it supremely in this blessed person Jesus, who is he? Son of God, son of man. Why has he come into the world? He's come into the world to reconcile us with God. 
Our troubles are all due to the fact that we are sinners in the sight of God. We are under the wrath of God. And if we die in that condition, we go to eternal misery. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son and gave him even to death, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, says Paul, you can stop your seeking and searching. You can stop anchoring after some new thing, the latest novelty, the latest fashion, the latest idea. Listen, it's all in this one person. Repent. Acknowledge that you're in trouble because you don't know God and you're under the wrath of God. Confess it. Acknowledge it. That's the meaning of repentance. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, says Paul, remarkable things will happen to you. You'll not only have forgiveness of your sins, you'll become a new person. You can have a new start. Jesus spoke a parable about a prodigal son who felt he'd sinned away his sonship and was not fit even to be a servant. But he was a son. And God is like that. You can have a new start. You know, said Paul, in effect, to these Athenians, you think that what you need is to hear something new. That isn't your need. What you need is to be made new. Not some new thing, not some new idea, not some new fad, not some new craze, not some new cult. What you need is to be made anew. You need to be renewed in the very spirit of your mind. You need to be created afresh. Then you won't be looking for something new ever and always. You'll have got it. You'll be related to God. You'll know how to live. You'll know how to die. And you'll know how to face eternity. Well, now that was his message. He was interrupted. But that was, is what he had been preaching everywhere. And this is the essential Christian message. Now then, my friends... I want to leave you with a question. To which are you trusting tonight? It's a very practical question. You are trusting to one or the other. Are you trusting to man and his reason and his politics and his sociology and his education and culture? Are you trusting to that? If you are, you're going to end in the same position as Greece and Rome and many another great dynasty, and every individual who's trusted to it, it all comes to nothing. Or are you trusting to this old message that God is over all, and that in spite of our folly, he has sent his own Son to deliver us, to give us a new life, so that even in this world, if everything should go wrong, we'll be unaffected. We shall be filled with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Which is it, my friend? Here some mocked. Others said we will hear thee again of this matter. But others clave unto him and believed. Which is it? Shall I leave you with reading to you two quotations? It's one or the other, I say. Let me then read to you some words written just before he died by one of the great historians of this present century, Professor G. M. Trevelyan of Cambridge. He was a great man, a great thinker, a great humanist. He was not a Christian and said so. But he was a man from the standpoint of culture and all that men can do at the very acme. Now this is what he wrote. I do not understand the age we live in. And what I do understand, I do not like. That's it. You'll never get better culture a more civilized person than the late Professor G. M. Trevelyan. And then he wrote a biography of Sir Edward Grey, afterwards Lord Grey, who was the Foreign Secretary at the time of the outbreak of the First World War. 
And I must read it to you because I want you to see, my dear friend, that if you're trusting a philosophy, you're going to be grievously disappointed and you're going to end in despair. This is what he wrote about Sir Edward Grey. He was the most perfect human being personally that I have ever seen. There will never be anyone like him again. For the hectic conditions of our modern world will, will, will not lead, will not breed the particular type of which he was the finest example. Listen, he was the last best flower of the English 19th century public life based on family tradition of public service and on the country house and the rural background. Elitism again. Then Trevelyan about himself. The things that I care about most are literature, art, imagination, and free intellect. They seem to me to be conditioned by a certain amount of leisure for some people, not for all, you notice. They're conditioned by a certain amount of leisure for some people and independence of mass orders. A certain amount of inequality of opportunity and leisure seems to me essential to the things that I care about. But it is going fast and in 50 years' time will be gone. Professor G. M. Trevelyan, and this is his last word, I am 86, and it is time I was off. That's the end of civilization. Is this what you're trusting to? Is it because you trust in this you don't attend a place of worship and ridicule the Bible? and laugh at Christianity, that's how it ends. Nothing. I'm 86. Time goes off. Everything failing. The great culture demands a certain amount of leisure for the elite, for the few. But it's going. All these ideas of the leveling of today, it makes it impossible. And with the leveling, you'll not have a decent life, says the great man. So here he is, he ends in final despair. His last word is, I am 86, it is time I was off. That's the civilized men. Listen to another man. Listen to this Apostle Paul writing at the end. I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only me, not the elitist elite few, not only me, but also unto them, that love is appearing, my dear friend. Which side are you on? That's where culture ends. Let me give you another. Walter Savage Landor, one of the poets of the last century. This is how he put the cultural point of view. Here he is at the end of his life. I fought with none, for none was worth my strife. Nature I loved, and next to nature, ah. I warmed both hands at the fire of life. It sinks. And I am ready to depart. Complete hopelessness. Oh, my dear friend, make sure that you're on the right side. The other side is this 10,000 times 10,000 in sparkling raiment bright. The armies of the ransomed hosts throng up the steeps of light. Tis finished, all is finished, their fight with death and sin. Fling open wide the golden gates and let the victors in. Are you going to be among them? Make sure of it. Repent, which means think again. 
Change your mind. See that all your troubles are due to the fact that you're a rebel against God, that you've made a God out of men and you're trusting the men, and that he fails and will fail. Repent! Believe the message of the gospel and you'll be amongst the ransom hosts that throng these lights eternal and you'll spend your eternity with all the spirits of just men made perfect, with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, angels, archangels, cherubim, and seraphim, in glory everlasting. Which is it, my friend? Is it civilization? Or is it the message of the Apostle Paul? Make sure, ere it be too late, let us pray. O oh Lord our God, how can we thank Thee that in a world in which we all have been so foolish and have gone astray like sheep and rebelled in arrogance against Thee, how can we thank Thee sufficiently that in such a world Thou dost still send Thine ancient message and the one and only hope in life and death and in the glory everlasting. God have mercy upon us. God open the eyes of the people. O oh Lord, awaken men and women. Cause them to think again. And by the power of thy spirit, open blind eyes and stop deaf ears. God save the people. And unto thee and unto thee alone, shall we give all the praise and all the honor and all the glory, both now and forever. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.